Our next panel, and last panel, is on accountability and the path ahead. You've already heard from Rick Kerwan, who appeared at the beginning, and quite appropriately will help us bring an end to this day. Jack Smith, Jack Smith, hi Jack, is superintendent of schools in Montgomery County, Maryland. He's been interim state superintendent of schools and treasurer of the Maryland State Board of Education. Jack has seen it all. From classroom teacher to the top of the Maryland system. Dave Steiner is director of the Johns Hopkins Institute for Education Policy. He is, according to Checker, still a member of the Maryland State Board of Education and a member of the Kerwan Commission. He joins a, a rather impressive group of former state commissioners of education who have appeared before you today as the former commissioner of education in New York State. And prior to that, dean of the Hunter College School of Education. We're gonna start off with Britt. We've asked Britt to talk about um, a topic that has repeatedly popped up its head in this day accountability. Okay. And we've asked him also to talk about the road ahead. Okay. Well, um, th the issue of accountability was, without a doubt, one of the most difficult ones uh, for, for the commission uh, to address. Um, and um, it, on the, it, it became absolutely clear to me and others that without a convincing accountability plan, we would not be able to generate uh, the public support for the commission. I have given endless numbers of talks, I may have mentioned that, to various groups around the state about what the commission has been working on, what its recommendations are, and almost without fail, um, the audience response is very positive to the four policy areas that we've been talking about today. They make sense to people, and they're impressed by the rigor with which we arrived at those uh, recommendations. But the next question is, how do we know if we invest the money, these things will actually happen? Um, and there is, rightly or wrongly, a perception uh, in the state that ca accountability left only to the State Board of Education will not do the trick. I say rightly or wrongly. Um, and people look back to the Thornton Commission, the predecessor commission to the uh, current the uh, Commission on Innovation and Excellence. And uh, there were many positive things in the Thornton Commission report. But as Mark, you indicated uh, in your opening remarks, uh, the investment of funds did not move the needle in the way that, that uh, people had, had expected. And so that feeds into this notion that accountability can't be left just to the State Board of Education. This, um, you know, we went round and round on, on, on this topic, and um, we finally uh, came upon a model uh, that's reflected in the report, uh, which calls for the creation of a small oversight board consisting of um, highly respected um, leaders in business and in the community and in education. Um, to be the final say um, in terms of the implementation of the recommendation and the allocation of funds. So it would be a group, let's say seven people, um, could be a corporate leader who had been uh, led a, a phenomenal change in a corporation. It would be in, include for sure higher uh, education experts, uh, community leaders, but uh, they would be outside of the education bureaucracy. Uh, they would be an independent body. And so as um, 
th th they would have the responsibility then of certifying that the LEAs had faithfully implemented the recommendations. Uh, this would come to them through uh, the LEAs up to the State Board of Education, then to this oversight body. And a portion of the new funding would be held back until this body certified that yes, the, the implementation had been faithful. I want to come back to a point that uh, David Driscoll made er earlier. Um, the, the, when you look at high-performing systems uh, internationally, they, are, um, uh, th they have a uh, high central authority. Uh, they are top-down. Uh, it is in the DNA of Amer Americans that education be should be locally controlled. And so how to find this balance uh, between, uh, in, in, between these two, two needs. And so um, the, the commission report uh, envisions that there are broad um, policy areas with a, a fair degree of a specificity, but local initiative in responding to how the implementation would move forward. And so uh, then the, the, the plans from the LEAs would come to the state board and then ultimately to this body that would uh, have to certify. Uh, and they would have independence and they would have to certify that the recommendations had been faithfully in implemented. And then in the out years of the 10-year implementation, there would have to be evidence that uh, progress was being made, that we were moving towards the goal for funds to continue to be, uh, new funds to be allocated. And this would not be punitive. The f there would be initially teams of, from high-performing schools to go in and work with schools to get them on track and rise to the performance levels that uh, had, been, had been hopeful for. But th this body would still have the authority to withhold a portion of the funding until uh, the LEAs uh, and individual schools got things right. So that's the model, and uh, it uh, sort of came out of whole cloth. Uh, we didn't have anything to draw upon because from all these wonderful international comparisons you have, that's not the way they operate. It's right. We made a set of proposals, but in this particular case, they were not based on anything we saw. There was nothing like what Britt just described anywhere in the United States. But we think that is what is going to be needed to make this work. So, Britt, if I can ask you one more question, the path ahead. Well, it's, it's, it's difficult. It, it, it is for all the reasons that have been, uh, have been talked uh, about uh, today. Um, the distribution of costs between uh, the, the local jurisdictions and the state, that's going to be a, a very challenging issue. Rachel will recall how difficult that was with the Thornton Commission. Um, so that's a, a huge uh, uh, hill to climb. Um, and then there is, there will be the need for additional investment in, in, in K through 12 uh, education. And um, there is, as we all know, a resistance um, to finding that revenue through any kind of uh, increases in, in taxes. Uh, I think this is only going to occur if um, that we have this grassroots um, uh, effort that so many have called for, but it's also got to come from um, the, grass, uh, the, the, the corporate leaders, the business community and community leaders uh, to, to make this case. And, and somehow we've got to, um, uh, and I think there is, there's an argu argument to be made here around the workforce issues when only less than 40% of our high school graduates are now deemed college and career ready. This gets the business community exercise. I've seen that too many times uh, when I've made presentations to them. So I do hold out some hope uh, that uh, we can build a, a broad coalition of support for this. Th there's one other thing that is uh, underway. There's a, there's a group, uh, there's an economic uh, organization in Baltimore called the SAGE, led by Anibon Basu, 
who has an, an economist who has great credibility uh, in, in the state. And he's actually doing a detailed analysis of what the ROI writ large would be. I think Craig Rice mentioned this earlier. Better education means more tax revenue because people have higher paying jobs. It means less investment in um, uh, public safety. It means lower costs uh, for health care delivery. It means all sorts of good things for a state. So he's doing a, a, a detailed analysis of what the economic impact would be on the state um, if the recommendations, if this report is fully implemented, the, re uh, the aspirations are realized. I think that could be a powerful argument in helping to build uh, the kind of broad coalition we're going to need to push this across the goal line. Thank you, Fred. Jack, what do you see when you look at this? Well, I, I think the um, areas of the report are spot on from what I've seen in 40 years of public education from Washington State to Asia for seven years and then to Maryland for the last 20. I think these are the areas that we ought to be working in. And as evidence, I will tell you, those are the areas we are working on in Montgomery County Public Schools right now. I felt very affirmed with the list you put up there. And I think that uh, there's real possibility and potential here. There's real hope to get this done. Um, the problem will be that we all have to be willing to stand together and work together because when adults fight, kids lose. And we only have 24 school systems in this state. That's a tremendous opportunity right there to only have 24 school systems. But I've learned in 20 years that 24 school systems, a general assembly, a state board, and all of the other uh, political and business leaders can fight, whether it's 24 in Maryland or 700 in Pennsylvania. So that's what we've got to resist, is throwing stones at each other and spend our time working together to build the case for doing this for the, the social and economic future of this state, because it really is at real risk. And I could reel off tons of numbers to you right now from Montgomery County that caused me to have a giant knot in my stomach every day. David? So we're in a very difficult national situation. We've had pushback from education reform. We now have sophisticated sophistry of reform rhetoric um, all over the place, uh, which is uh, asking us to take our eye off achievement, which is asking us to use proxies increasingly and be satisfied with them. This is a really courageous blueprint in the face of that reaction. This is a blueprint that says adults need to work together on behalf of children, need to be serious about it. And at the core of it is a sense that we have an enormous drift in this country away from what we owe our children. We know that we're massively under teaching American children. Uh, they are bored in many cases because they are not the foolish ones. The children know they're being undertaught. Uh, this is a report that says we owe our children the kind of education that was promised to our parents uh, by a country 50 years ago. What this means is that all sorts of places, and this takes us back to Britt's point on accountability, we're going to have to win tough battles to define success in serious terms. Let me give you quick examples. Uh, Chuck had talked about this 10th grade assessment and the, the necessity that the new assessment of Maryland actually be geared to serious college and career standards. I'm on the board and I'm nervous, right? I want to be sure that that state assessment is a benchmark we can all be excited about. Uh, Senator Pinsky talked about Ed Tipa, talked about other assessments. Uh, we've talked about, with terrific uh, support, the national board certification. We need to work with these people so that those standards are meaningful, not just rubber stamps. Uh, praxis was mentioned. This is the test that almost all teachers across the country take. The pass rates are usually 95%. That's not a serious standard. So what I'm saying is that 
we, we can't be satisfied by just naming things like assessments, like tests, like, uh, you know, percentage graduating. Let me give you one last example, because this one is a horror for me, and I know it's a horror for the brilliant superintendent in Baltimore, Sonia Sanstelisis. We have a fairly, very, I wouldn't say fairly, a modest high school graduation standard in Maryland. It meant passing two assessments at a quite modest level. Now, the graduation rate for the state is like 86%, and the graduation rate in Baltimore City, which has intense poverty, is well over 75%. I was impressed by that when I came to, to Baltimore for the first time. Then I discovered that 36% of those who graduated from Baltimore last year did so thanks to something called the Bridge Project, meaning they'd failed the exam, and then they went back to school. Now, if they went back and did something valuable and demanding, that's wonderful, because not everyone passes an exam. But when I asked on the board what the fail rate was for that Bridge Project, they couldn't give me a single indicator. So 36% of the Baltimore graduates aren't, in any sense, graduating. That's what I mean by what that body is going to have to do. I think of the base closing commission, right? Congress put the base closing commission there because Congress knew it couldn't police itself. And as a board member, I'm absolutely on board with the recommendations of the Kerwin Commission, on which I served, that says we need that body, right? We need that body to help us to really deliver for children against serious standards. That is going to take real perseverance, and it's going to take transparency. We can't hide between many, many little decisions that will gradually eat away at the great work that Brit has led. So persistence, courage, toughness on behalf of children is going to be crucial, otherwise we will lose this reform. Thank you, David. So this brings us to the end of the last panel. Thank you, each one of you, very much. Colleagues, uh, we're going to move to um, a, final, a final segment, but before we do, Rachel, um, there was a question that was posed that you might recall pre the break and I think the best way of capturing it is this. The Maryland Commission title is on innovation and excellence in education. There have been a number of questions that have come forward to say we know we've talked about equity, we know we've talked about the achievement gap if you put equity front and centre, as clearly the Commission report does, what is the best way of communicating that to others, that this is an agenda that will seriously address equity? And we know that all of the highest performing education systems internationally have done just that. Uh, sure. So. Um uh, the Commission spent a lot of time talking about equity, talking about um, closing the achievement gaps for students who are low income, for students who don't speak English, for students who have disabilities, um, for other students who, for whatever reason, you know, race, um, there's a lot of discussion about race and, and how that interacts with um, achievement. and. There's actually, I think, a very powerful chapter in the interim report that tries to kind of tie that all together. And uh, I think it's chapter four. And focus on, and, and I think Dave Driscoll, or it might have been Mark, somebody mentioned, I, I, I think um, this commission's report and hopefully implementation um, doesn't just, just, just having Maryland maybe go to the top of the NAEP tables or whatever, do well in P on PISA, would be an accomplishment. But the real accomplishment will be uh, closing the achievement gaps and ensuring that every student in Maryland, regardless of their zip code, 
uh, is receiving that high quality education and opportunity for life. I mean, that's what education is all about. And while it's not in the title of the commission, it is front and center in the commission's work, both in the policy work that's been done already and in the next phase of the work, which is developing the funding formulas that actually distribute the money in a, in a way that is equitable and provides more resources for the, for the students who need them. Thank you, Rachel, very much.